Hey guys, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to go ahead and get started talking about annuity sales and kind of uh, an introduction to how to start that conversation. What do some of those frequently asked questions look like? And just really try to help you become comfortable carrying on those conversations with your clients and with your prospects. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into the good stuff. Do me a favor. When you have a question, I'm going to do my best with the progression of this um, webinar to answer as many questions um, that you might have. And then if I haven't answered all of your questions, do me a favor, jot them down through the progression of it, and then we'll answer them at the end. So what we're going to go over today, where our little agenda is going to be just going through a client needs assessment is what helps us get the conversation started and just letting you see what our needs assessment looks like. For some of you guys, it, um, it's probably nothing new to you. If you've seen it before, and that's great. And then how do we arrive at being able to make a recommendation for uh, a specific product for a, a particular client? What are some of the client concerns? What are the objections? What are the, well, the feedback that they're going to give you? Man, it would be nice to know the answers to the test uh, before you even take the test. How to move the money? Hey, the money's sitting at Edward Jones or Raymond James. What does that transfer process look like? And through this whole thing, uh, it's just to give you some comfort and confidence to be able to have those conversations. If you're not comfortable, if you're not confident, you're not going to have those conversations. So that's the goal here. Definitely ask questions to overcome some of those hurdles. Lastly, the transfer process. Um, when we are moving the money, what, what do I need to tell the client um, before this transfer takes place? How can I be proactive versus reactive? Um, just, just to make the process as smooth as possible. Last but not least, we will open it up to question and answer and, and uh, welcome all of those questions and, and uh, go from there. Jumping right into the good stuff. Client needs assessment. You guys have seen it before. We're going to give you a snapshot. Definitely download and use the needs assessment just as we use it or make it your own. Put it in the own ver your own verbiage, but it all comes with question number 10 when we start talking about money. I want to spend a little bit of time on the needs assessment, 30 seconds or less, with the needs assessment the client knows that we are looking at their best interest at heart, that it's not everybody that we sit across the table from, we're cramming the same thing down somebody's throat. We're really taking evaluation of what they have going on. And based on this information, we can then make a recommendation for them. So it then comes down once we've figured out kind of every looking at the big picture through their needs assessment. And then we get to question number 10. As we dive into question number 10 on this next slide here, it will say, do you, I just say it this way, do you have any IRAs or 401ks? It's all I ask. Do you have any 401ks or IRAs? It opens up the conversation of what they have. And as I label what they have, the name of the company that has the money, let's pick on Fidelity or whatever, um, Edward Jones, Raymond James, we label what they have, where it's located, and I will say in any other investments. So that's all it is, is just, and so I think uh, right out of the gate, you're saying, how do I know that they're going to actually answer these questions? Uh, I know that when you set it all up with the needs assessment and say, in order to make the best recommendation for you, I'm going to gather some information uh, to see the big picture, to know that I'm making the best recommendation for you. When you preface that needs assessment with that little clause, they're going to share they're going to put it all on a platter for you so that you can help them make the most informed decision. So then once you ask that question, there are two follow-up questions um, to that. Number one, when do you plan to use this money? And I'm going to stay there for just a second. Mrs. Jones, you've got this 401k, you've got this IRA. How soon do you think you need to supplement your monthly income with this 401k, let's just say? And most of the time they say, you know, I'm going to have social security. Most of what I have is paid for, if not everything. I'm going to have a little pension. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to need it right away. Uh, I'm told I'm supposed to take it or have to start taking it at some point in time. And so I say, yeah, that required minimum distribu distribution age. And they're like, yeah. And I say, do you plan to take anything out before then? No, probably not. That's the most common answer. Not always going to be the answer. Some may say, hey, as soon as I retire, I need $1,000 a month. 
to supplement my monthly income. Social security is not going to be enough. Based on that answer, number one, when do you plan to use the money? The second question, how much do you plan to use at that time? When I have the answers to just those two simple questions, so we have identified what they have, where it's located, then I'm asking, when do you plan to use it and how much do you plan to use? From there, I can make a rock solid recommendation. And I know through my little Rolodex of uh, products, um, I know which one is going to fit them the best. And we're not sharing the same thing with every person that comes in. When I say sharing, we're not recommending the same thing for every person uh, that we sit down with. So jump into the next slide here. Uh, again, I'm being a little bit redundant, but I know when you plan to use the money and how much you plan to use, and I'm going to match a product specifically to that. If you need X amount of dollars, I'm going to make sure that the plan I'm recommending has the liquidity that you need to access the money when you need it. I'm going to highlight two plans that are very, very popular right now. And I love to just share this little um, old preface or disclaimer. We are not married to, we know you guys are not married to any one insurance company. We're independent brokers. We can represent whoever we want and whoever has the most competitive product and plan for that client profile is who we're going to recommend. My top two recommendations are going to be from the same company. That can change next month, but I'm just highlighting two of them today. So let's jump into the first one. The first one is just going to be a three-year plan uh, with a company called Silac out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. They have, and I normally talk about 5.59% guaranteed interest, no fees, no risk, and you get to take out 5% per year. What's cool about this plan, we could start by saying, hey, it's 5.65. But I know most of the time people either need free withdrawals or required minimum distributions or something. And I want to make sure that they have some liquidity if they need money out of that plan. So normally I'm just presenting a 5.59 and it includes a 5% free withdrawal. There are other riders that you can add to this plan. And with each rider, you are reducing, it's a rate reduction. You're reducing the interest rate that you're offering the client based on whatever riders that you need. This is as plain vanilla as it gets. Mrs. Jones, you are going to get, uh, let's use 559, 5.59% guaranteed for the next three years, compounding interest, tax deferred, um, and even though you have the ability to take out 5% free withdrawal, doesn't mean you have to. Frequently asked question, if I don't take out my 5% in my first after my first year, in my second year, or third, can I take out 10% in the next year if I didn't take it in the first? No, it's just 5% for that year. Um, so that's it on that particular product. It's simple, it's straightforward, it doesn't matter. If it's IRA money, 401k money, it's in a CD, it's in their savings account, it's in their checking account, doesn't matter where it is, we're going to help you in a future slide here, know how to get money from point A to point B without creating a taxable event for a client and uh, make sure that we're just doing it properly. The second product recommendation is going to be a little bit more in depth. So hang with me, guys, and uh, I'll walk you through exactly how I present option number two. Option number two is also, again, going to be with Silac. It's a Denali product, and they have three different lengths of term. I'm going to highlight just one to just try and keep this. This is an introduction. This is not selling you on the idea you need to be presenting this. It's when the client profile matches this description that you're saying, Mrs. Jones, after reviewing your needs assessment and saying that uh, this 401, uh, and I keep talking about 401, 401k, 403b, IRAs, regular savings, doesn't matter. This is a great fit for any one of those. Um, based on when you plan to use this money and how much you plan to use at this time, I would recommend a plan such as this. This plan is going to give you some pretty cool flexibility on how you get to earn interest. We're going to jump right into the next slide here which is going to be, I'm in presentation mode. Here we go. Mrs. Jones, 
this is a snapshot of what you have going on right now. Your money can go in one of three ways. The plan that's described on the next, which I do front and back, on the back side of this page, which will be our next slide, uh, shows you that you have a guarantee that this, and I do a squiggly line right across that down arrow, this down arrow cannot happen. So you have safety. You can never go backwards. You have no fees. There's only, and there are two ways on how you can earn interest. Side note, timeout from presentation. There are more than two ways. I only recommend sharing two ways on how they can earn interest. When we get into all of the other options on how they can earn interest, it just gets muddy. It gets complicated. It's overwhelming. And I'm making a strong recommendation just to say there are two ways on how you can earn interest. Number one, Mrs. Jones, you can just lock in a fixed interest rate. That fixed interest rate right now is 5.75%. Come hell or high water, you know for the next year, you're getting 5.75%. Fantastic. Or the second option is you can say, hey, what if things are going really well in the market? I don't want to be in the market, but what if I could get better interest um, following an index such as the S&P 500? You have the second option is to say, I want to follow the S&P annual point to point, pretend like uh, May 1st is my start date. Where is the S&P 500 on May 1st of this year to May 1st of next year? And whatever the percentage change in the S&P 500 is, is how you're going to be credited interest. So here's a couple of examples. We've already just discussed that you can't lose a dime. You can never go backwards. So we say zero is your hero. If you choose to follow the S&P 500, the worst case scenario is you can have a year if the S&P goes down that you don't grow at all, but you'll never lose. If the S&P goes up 5%, you earn five. If it goes up seven, you earn seven. There's a trade-off because you're given this guarantee that it'll never go down. Um, the trade-off is they put a cap or a maximum on how much you can make in the good years. Let's jump to the second page, which I call the back, slide, back side of this page. And the highlights are as such. At the top of the page, it'll show you, Mrs. Jones, that after your first year, you can start taking out 5% per year. This right here is normally, if this plan does not work out, it's because of this reason right here. Some people need a greater free withdrawal, and we have plans that are going to give you a greater free withdrawal. But this plan offers the greatest interest offering and a 5% free withdrawal. If we want to go to a greater free withdrawal, we're going to be offering a plan that has lesser interest. So we start here hoping this works out for you. And if it doesn't, we can move on to the next option. It's not your only option. Next, Mrs. Jones, next bullet is um, biggest expense you can run into in retirement is if you need care, home care assisted living, nursing home. Um, let me just back up. I just blurted in a word here that I don't normally say. Home care, nursing care, or have a, a terminal illness. If you're diagnosed with a terminal illness, need nursing care, or need home care, 100% of these funds are put loose and fancy free. Keep in mind, I mentioned that there's two ways on how you can choose to earn interest. One is following the S&P. If I'm going to follow the S&P, I want to know what the history is over the last 30 years. And over the last 30 years, it has averaged 10%. If I know that that's a history of it over the last 30, uh, 30 years, 10%, do I really want to get my site set on 15? Probably not, just to be realistic. And so just know that if the S&P goes up 5%, you get it. 10%, you get it. It goes above 15. 15 is going to be the most that you can make. So anywhere between zero and 15%. Number two, we've already said it, each year you can adjust your game plan, adjust your strategy. And you say, may say, you know what? I'm well satisfied with just locking in a rate of 5.75 to just until we get to where we feel like the, the, the future or the forecast is a little bit more promising. And I want to be 5.75 right now. Maybe next year on my anniversary date, I may choose to follow the S&P. I don't love what I'm doing right now, guys. I'm getting so far into the weeds. This is an introduction. This is a plan. A lot of people want to know what we're presenting. 
um, you know, what does the presentation look like? So I just got into the, the weeds of that because that is truly what that presentation looks like. So we'll keep going to let you know how we hold the client's hand once they've made a selection between, let's say, those two plans that we just highlighted. So the next thing is, um, I think as a salesperson or, or an agent, as you guys all are, this might be what you are more interested in. Well, what's the best way to answer these concerns and objections? And so we'll just highlight a few of them that I see most frequently. Number one is going to be, if I roll over my 401k or IRA, I, I've never done it because I don't want to pay taxes. Am I going to have to pay taxes if I roll this over? And I proactively build into the presentation that Mrs. Jones, because you are not taking a distribution, you're not making um, taking a withdrawal, it's a non-taxable event. So you can move this money uh, to an insurance company, you can move it to the bank, you can move it to the market, and you are never taking a withdrawal or a distribution. So therefore, it is a non-taxable event. That's number one. Number two is going to be um, a lot of these people, if they have a financial advisor, they're thinking, holy crap, I don't want to have to break up with my Edward Jones rep. You know, he seems like a nice guy, nice gal, and I don't want to face that un awkwardness and uncomfortableness. Ms. Jones, you will not have to go to your advisor and break up with them. It is easy as I have a, a transfer form that you sign, and it's instructions saying I want money moved from point A to point B. I get to take care of all of that transfer request. Number three is going to be you're not doing this uh, for your health. Um, everybody has to make a living. How do you make money if there's no fees involved? And I say this, Mrs. Jones, built into the pricing, built into the pricing of the product of health insurance, of life insurance, of these guaranteed contracts, um, built into the pricing, the insurance companies know that they're going to pay a broker for writing the business. And 100% of your deposit earns that guaranteed interest rate, and you don't have to account for any fees, any commissions, period. Let me back up and press timeout for a second. There are plans that have fees associated with them. The plans I'm talking about have none. So I have always been able to offer a plan that doesn't have any fees, and that's what I'm recommending in this scenario. Number four, is this insured? I don't know that I get this a lot, but I will get this. Mrs. Jones, not only are you dealing with a reputable insurance company that has a great history and great rating, all of that's great. Play doomsday. Worst case scenario, if you have your money in the bank, you're reinsured by the FDIC to $250,000. If you have money with an insurance company, you're also reinsured by the Guarantee Association up to $250,000. So you're reinsured both places the same. There's no advantage to be in the bank thinking that uh, I'm reinsured by 250, you're in insured 250 both ways. Last but not least on the client concerns and objections. Uh, man, I feel so passionate about this part right here. Proactively, you want to share. I'm talking about, so far you haven't really heard me say anything about annuities. We've talked about fixed contracts or guaranteed contracts. Until you have the opportunity to share a little bit of education that, Mrs. Jones, there are three types of these contracts, um, and there's one of them that I would not recommend. A variable annuity is like a cuss word in our world because you could be offered, let's say, 5% guarantee and charge up to 6% in fees. We don't want a variable annuity. What I'm talking to you about is not that. It is either a fixed annuity or an indexed annuity, fixed index annuity. With those, I can recommend them to the cows come home. My mom has each of them. I wouldn't recommend it for my mom if it wasn't good. So um, when you have the opportunity to educate that we're not talking about a variable annuity, I think you proactively have to build that into your presentation. Otherwise, they're not telling you, but they're thinking, man, I've heard some good and some bad. I'm not sure if this is a good thing. Build it into your presentation, share it. What it's not, it's not a variable annuity. Keep rolling here, how to move money. We have two more little uh, short sections here, um, and then we'll be ready for questions. I love this little cheat sheet to give you confidence uh, to be able to say, it doesn't matter where the money is. If it's with an investment firm, Edward Jones, Raymond James, wherever, 
If it's with an employer and it's still sitting with the employer, if it's money sitting in a bank or it's an insurance company, doesn't matter. This little cheat sheet is going to help you make sure that you know how to properly get funds from point A to point B. And so I encourage you to download that. Actually, it's going to be sent in a link, right, Jay? Uh, it's going to be sent in an email after this webinar, um, and you'll have that. But just have that on hand, print it out, and it's just going to be your guide um, knowing how to move money from point A to point B, okay? That was really short. I don't know that I need to get into anything there. The transfer process, uh, another proactive piece. This is the last piece here. With the transfer process, it can feel intimidating to the client if you don't ease their mind by letting them know. I've already shared this once. Mrs. Jones, the transfer process is this. I have a transfer form that you get to sign, which is instruction saying, move money from point A to point B. Here is where the money is currently located. There's four things I got to have. The name of the institution that holds the money, their address, their phone number, and your account number. When we have those four things, I just have you sign a transfer form and that's your instructions requesting money to transfer from point A to point B. That's number one. Number two, uh, you will not be required to break up with your broker. Again, they won't tell you this, but it's in the back of their mind if they have dealt with any broker in the past, um, because this transfer form is going to take care of that. Number three is going to be no matter where the money sits. And I can just, it doesn't, I don't need to, but I could list every financial institution that we transfer funds from. Every one of them are going to throw in an extra hoop, like, extra wrinkle. And I tell them proactively, miss. and if you don't do this, they're going to feel like something's wrong. They get cold feet and they just want to cancel. Been there, done that. If you can let them know, Mrs. Jones, when we get go get ready to initiate the transfer, um, Raymond James is going to throw us a little curveball and they're going to try and, and say, oh, well, we got your transfer form, but uh, we need a signature on our transfer form, on our letterhead transfer form. Fine, send it to us. Um, some of those other things are, I'm picking on Fidelity. Fidelity will only take a transfer request or honor a transfer request over the phone. So we just know that those extra hoops are necessary. We still have to have the transfer form, but most of the time, companies will not move on transferring money without a follow-up phone call, which number four is going to be 10 days. I tell everybody 10 days after we send in the transfer request, we feel like that is a a reasonable amount of time for them to honor request. We know they're not going to do anything with it until we do a three-way phone call. They won't tell us anything, me, the agent, until we schedule that follow-up phone call and just say, Mrs. Jones, this is just part of the process. I will lead the whole conversation. Uh, I'll lead the whole conversation and um, uh, lost my train of thought. Lead the whole conversation. You don't really, you just, they won't give me any information without you giving permission. So you have to be on the phone. Um, making it feel not so intimidating, like, oh my gosh. So that's that on the transfer process. Do we have one more there? Nothing. Guys, I just went like wildfire, I felt like, uh, trying to share how we bring up the conversation, client needs assessment. What are those, what is the process? How do I know that I know that I'm making the best recommendation for the client when it comes to a product? Highlighted two of them. And then what are the most frequent client concerns and objections? We touched on those. And then what can we expect with the transfer process? Before I hit on the first question, I'd really like to give a quick commercial um, for Kirk in our office that when you have any doubt, um, lack confidence, and you're like, hey, I, I don't even know what to recommend. All that you have to do, your only job is, is to ask those questions off of the needs assessment. Do you have a 401k? Do you have an IRA? Any other investments? So you've labeled what they have and where it's located. And then you're asking the two-part two question. If I encourage everybody to write it down. When do you plan to use the money? And how much do you plan to use at that time? When you share, when you have that information and you simply call Kirk right here in our office and share that information. Kirk will hold your hand and share, share with you what plan he would recommend. And that's his game. That's what he shines at and uh, a lot of things, but that's what he will be able to help you with. So 
This is me wrapping up, jumping into the question and answer. Jaybird, if you don't mind, fire away. Okay, we have, if the client says, yes, I do have a 401k, but what does that have to do with me turning 65 and getting on Medicare? Love the question. When we are not comfortable with the process that I'm sharing today, um, we have a lot of these doubts in our minds like, gosh, this is going to be so uncomfortable to ask. How do I know that they're even going to answer? I'm here to tell you that if you start your little segment by saying, in order to make the best recommendation for you, I'm going to gather some information to better understand what you have going on and to see the big picture. And based on that information, I will feel ever so confident making the best recommendation for you. Let's pretend like it's Medicare. Out of 24 plans, I know with the meds that you're on and the pharmacy you go to, I know which plan is best for you. Without a shadow of doubt. I know that this company, based on where you live, your zip code, this is your best. Let's pretend like it's Medicare supplement. Best price, standardized plans. Blah, blah. They're going to follow your recommendation on the drug piece. They're going to follow your recommendation on the supplement. And it doesn't change when you go to make that recommendation for the supplement. So they know why you're asking these questions. Um, I want to hit on that. I love the question. I wanted to just expand on it a little bit. Sometimes a defense mechanism or something in us agents is, well, you know, I'm really a Medicare expert. I'm just going to stay in my lane and that's my wheelhouse. Doggone it. If I can help somebody with something because I educate myself on these topics and I can help them not only with their Medicare piece, but on a 401k rollover, knowing that I'm giving them safety, stability, no fees, great interest, flexibility of their cash. It's just an added product and service that I get to help somebody with. Yes, it. we don't do this for health. It it helps our bottom line, no doubt about it. But don't don't close your mind to this whole idea because I'm going to stay in my lane because I'm a Medicare agent. Next question. Hey, do you have do you do many FIAs with income riders on them or mostly MIGAs? Uh, do a lot of FIAs. Do a lot of MIGAs. Don't normally include don't don't normally uh, exercise the income for life feature. Can you hit that question one more time? Make sure I'm there. Yeah. Do you do many FIAs with income riders? Income on riders. So the FIA that I'm uh, mentioning, there is built into it, and I'm I'm giving Silac one heck of a commercial built into it. You could have, you can exercise this income for life feature. We normally don't uh, because normally the question uh, of when do you plan to use it and how much do you plan to use Normally, their answer is not, I need this to be, give me the most income as soon as I retire. Normally, that is not the answer. When it is, absolutely, we'll look at those with have an income writer. It's just not what we see the most of. Great question. Okay, and uh, I think this popped in when, when we had the two examples, uh, the two Silac examples. Um, can you make a sample of how much that account accumulates after three years? On the, are we on the Denali? I'm sorry. I think it was the other one. Okay, there. the other one. So I just do an interestcalculator.com, I think is what it is, but you can just type in interest calculator and it will pull up this little tool that will just say your starting figure is 100,000 and my interest rate is 5.59%, how long, three years, and it will tell you exactly what's going to be, what you're going to earn each year with compounding interest and it will show you a total at the end of the three years. There may be a better way to do it, but that's what I do. Okay. How is, how is Denali's rate integrity? Do they hold rates steady or the 15% cap is a teaser rate and goes down after a year? Love it. Um, I'm going to say that I can't tell you how many years, but I will say that there has been some pretty good consistency. Uh, I worry about that. I, that's a great question. I worry about that. Hey, are we just getting this good rate to get them in the door and get them to sign on the bottom line? And then when renewal comes around, they just drop that sucker. They have had some reductions, but not anything drastic. It stays right in the ballpark of what they have um, offered initially for that client. So, and I didn't mention this to you guys, but I tell with every presentation, I say, guys, there's a million different things I could recommend for you. I'm going to share with you when we get to the Denali product, I'm going to share with you exactly what I recommended for my own mom. And you would be blown away at how many people reference that. Well, shoot, if it's good enough for your mom, it's good enough for me. I don't know that I want to understand all the nitty gritty detail. Just 
that's what I want. And, and so uh, when you do have that testimony, I guess, to share that this is what I recommended for one of your loved ones or something, uh, I think it really does help add some oh, peace of mind to, to the client. Okay, what is the sweet spot in terms of prospects? Married, single, female, male? What is the sweet spot in terms of prospect? I will tell you the sweet spot for me is when you have, man, I can get carried away on this one. When you have somebody that's coming to you for Medicare education and they need help, you are the expert and they are following your guidance. These are people that have worked hard their whole lives. They've never made a whole lot of money and therefore they've never had a financial advisor, Edward Jones, Raymond James, I'm just blurting out those names. And so when they get ready to retire, they have no idea what they should be doing with a 401k. And so the sweet spot for me is those people that are getting ready to retire and they need the Medicare education that helps establish credibility, number one. Then it's just, we're already, oh my gosh, you can do that too. Like we're already helping them with this. They have the trust. Otherwise they wouldn't be there in the first place. Uh, trust to do business with you on the other piece. It just doesn't stop there as long as you present yourself with confidence and and um, and help them with that piece as well. So that's the sweet spot. They're getting ready to retire. It is my recommendation that as soon as you and your employer are no longer contributing to a retirement account, to roll it over. It's the wisest thing I can recommend. Secure what you have. Don't let it go backwards. And here are a couple of options that fit your description based on when you plan to use it and how much you plan to use at that time. Okay, Anthony, is it, is it mandatory for the client to withdraw a certain percentage once they reach a certain age, like age 72 or something like that? Great question. Uh, only on tax qualified accounts such as IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, et cetera. Why? You were able to put all this money into an account pre-taxed um, during your working years. And when you reach a certain age now, it's age 73. So it was 70 and a half went to 72, it's now age 73. At age 73, you're gonna get a letter indicating that uh, this 401k or IRA, um, you have to start taking out what's called an RMD, required minimum distribution. And it starts out just below 4% that you're required to start taking out. And only the portion that gets taken out is taxable. Um, so that's another reason why that Denali product works so well. It has a 5% free withdrawal. It is RMD friendly. Um, Anyway, it just fits in a lot of scenarios. I feel like I'm working for Silac right now. Okay, John asks, if a prospect has limited assets, 401k, savings, et cetera, would you suggest a SPIA if they are 65 and or receiving Social Security? Uh, SPIAs have a place. SPIAs are good. Um, they're not for everybody. It all comes back to when do you plan, and you guys are going to get tired of hearing me say this, when do you plan to use this money, start drawing on this money, and how much do you need at that time? If, if a person needs it immediately, they're saying, hey, Social Security isn't going to cut it, and I need this, and, and then, then a SPIA would be great. What I'm fearful of is them running out of money too soon. So we try to help them uh, with, with a little bit of planning when it comes to retirement finances. Do we need to define SPIA? Single premium immediate annuity, SPIA. So I, I, I just instant, I give a chunk of change to an insurance company. It's in an annuity and immediately I'm getting a check, let's say every month to supplement my monthly income. Single premium immediate annuity. That's how that's going to work. Okay. Uh, when are you doing the, I think this means the annuity presentation. They're, they're there for Medicare initially. End of the fact finder, last question brings up the IRA and 401k questions. Do you leave it and address it later or tackle it before the Medicare conversation? Love it, love it, love it. Um, go through the entire progression of the client needs assessment, 100% for sure. Once we get done with it, I don't let them say, well, I'm most, most interested or concerned about this and this is what I want to talk about. I get to say, and I'm not saying this, but you and I were, were the experts. We know what their sense of urgency is. We know what they need first. And so I take a proactive approach. And I say, guys, based on this needs assessment, there's a lot of things that we can help you with. But based on 
uh, whatever has the most sense of urgency, which is Medicare, you're getting ready to retire, da, 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 da. We're going to start with this piece, but we're going to tackle the other pieces at a later date. You're just setting the stage that not every time you come in here, am I trying to sell you something else? We've taken a good little profile of what you have going on, outline of what you have going on, and I'm going to make some recommendations based on that. And information overload is a very real thing. I'm not trying to tackle everything in one setting. So to answer the question directly, we're normally taking care of the Medicare piece first. And as I'm wrapping up that segment, I say, guys, at the bottom of this, uh, one of the last questions is, is just um, talking through your IRA 401k role. I'm going to give you a preview of what we're going to talk about when we when you come back. It's more of an introduction. It's a lot to absorb. So I just want you to know blah. And so I roll into that portion of it and let them know that in a couple of weeks, your policy is going to come in. Card goes to you. Policy comes to me. And when that policy comes in, I'm going to call you and we're going to go over everything one more time. And I want you to bring the most recent statement on your investments, whether it's 401k, IRA, brokerage account, doesn't matter. Bring the most recent statement. They don't even know what their statement means, says. They don't know how to read it. So it's your job just to interpret, hey, this is what you have going on. Um, and, and people will just blurt out random stuff like, yeah, I think it's a Roth IRA. You get the statement and it's not even close to a Roth IRA. So that statement helps you make sure that you're headed in the right direction. Okay, Vikal, uh, I'm asking this because only one company so far publishes renewal rates history on existing products for all the past years. Oh, that, that, that was must be related tied to a previous yeah. question. Okay, Courtney, Michael, I think you're doing great. Sometimes we need a little look into the weeds. We're in the weeds, doggone <laughs> it. Michelle, what is the minimum deposit for opening an annuity? Also, are there any carriers paying a bonus to the client based on their deposit amount? Yes, yes, and yes, all of the above. Um, minimum guarantee for the most part is ten thousand. There are definitely some some outfit uh, some some options where you can say that the minimum is five thousand, and we have one that goes all the way down to twenty five hundred. So, as a rule, I just blurted out, "Hey, the minimum to start a plan is ten thousand dollars." If they have a really small deal, we'll find a place for it, but it's not going to be one of the most one of the most attractive interest rates, but we can help them with that. I didn't answer all those questions there. Uh, minimum deposit. Uh, bonuses. Bonuses, yes, absolutely. I don't love the bonuses. And I'm just on my soapbox, and I'm just one guy, and I'm just one opinion. The bonuses feel gimmicky. They feel like, and so I don't normally, like I'm picking on the Denali. You can have the Denali bonus plan that offers a nice bonus up front, but all of your participation rates, caps, interest offerings are not as good, or you can just go with a straight Denali. I rarely, if ever, offer the Denali bonus. I think the only time you would be offering a bonus is if they're going to be uh, having a penalty coming from another contract, and you use that bonus to kind of help offset that penalty. But I don't, I don't love it, but that's my opinion. Okay, Terry asks, how do we talk about the FDIC and State Guarantee Association and remain in compliance? Yeah, um, I'm not the person to ask for this, uh, but because I may not say everything just right, but I'll tell you how I say it. It is my understanding that uh, we can't proactively bring it up, but if they ask us about it, we can then talk about it. And so I say, if it does come into the equation, I will say, you know, similarly to the bank being reinsured by the FDIC up to 250, each insurance contract is reinsured in the back of every policy will have the guarantee association um, showing that life insurance reinsured to 300,000 uh, annuities reinsured to 250. And that's how I specific, I mean, almost exactly word for word address that. So uh, one more time, I don't think we can pr be proactive and say it, but if they ask us about it, we can talk about it. I think that's compliant. Okay, so after they answer the couple of questions regarding their retirement funds, where do you go from there? After answering the question regarding their retirement funds, where do you go from there? Two-part question. When do you plan to use this money? How much do you plan to, to, to use at that time? When I know the answers to those two simple questions, I know when they need the money and how much they need, and then I can make a product recommendation. 
if you have the answers to those questions and you're saying, okay, Michael, you may know, but I don't, on our website, newhorizonsmarketing.com, you can go to the products tab, you can go to the annuities, and you can view rates, and you can just view all of the rates there. When you have questions, Kirk is our go-to for all of those nitty-gritty questions and can help hold your hand, and I mean this, get three under your belt. Let Kirk hold your hand for three annuity sales after you've done three of them and you're off to the races and you have tremendous confidence and comfort and you're ready to rock and roll. Okay, Richard, could you go over the three-party phone call again, please? Yeah, three-party phone call, three-way call. Mrs. Jones, 10 days after we submit this, we're going to initiate a three-way phone call. Let's pretend like it's Fidelity. Um, you know, based on your statement, here is your the, the number to Fidelity. We are going to call you. We're going to be on the phone. We're going to call Fidelity. I do it off of the dog on cell phone when I do it. A lot of times I'll have my uh, assistant do it, but I only because I don't know how to use a three-way on our landline. <laughs> Telling the truth. Um, and and uh, we say, Mrs. Jones, um, we're going to bring them on the line and they're going to ask for permission for me to be able to be on the phone to, to when they share information about your account. That's almost what they say. And so then you say, okay, do you give Michael permission to be on the phone? Yes. Um, what can we help you with today? That's what they're saying. We just need help uh, rolling over a 401k. Okay, let me help you get processed with this or help you with this process. Um, where do you want it to go? They need to know the company name that it's going to go to. Pretend like we're still on SILAC. They need to know their address. There are times on that three-way phone call that they will tell you, we will only mail the check to the recipient, to the retiree. That's fine, but the check is not made out to the retiree. The check is made out to the carrier, the insurance company that's going to, FBO, for the benefit of, and then it's the client's name. You do that to prevent a taxable event. The client is not cashing it out. They are not withdrawing it. They're simply rolling it over to a new financial institution. Um, some of them are uh, done in eight minutes. I mean, just pretty doggone quick. Uh, but that's what that three-way phone call looks like. Okay, I understand using Medicare needs as a door opener, but do you have any marketing ideas for reaching out to existing clients or non-Medicare prospects? I think I think existing clients is just working renewals. Um, that's a big part, just staying in front of them, trying to make sure that they're um, in the best place possible. Rate increases come from time and time, and you're trying to keep them in the best place possible. While doing that, it is a little bit awkward. I know this from experience. If you're asking questions or bringing up these topics to existing clients, when you've never brought this up in the past, why are you doing it now? Um, and so it does feel a little bit. So I think you need to preface it with something that goes like this. And I'm shooting from the hip. Mrs. Jones, um, you know, interest rates are crazy. The market is crazy. Based on, we've asked these questions off the needs assessment, based on this information, there's something I want to share with you. Um, and that is that we offer some really good interest rates. Um, you know, you're still sitting with a CD that's earning one and a half percent, and I'm just happy to share with you, we can offer a 5.59% guaranteed plan. And that's really all it is. You're in it before you know it, but it's just that little segue, that little preface to that renewal appointment over to uh, tackling, um, you know, a, a annuity presentation. Okay, Mike asks, what extra training or certifications do you need to sell these annuities? Life and health license and um, jump on our website. We have a ton, no other certification. Jump on our website. We have a ton of resources, a ton of training. Uh, we're, we're, we have old client presentations. When I, I'm literally sitting there with a client, we got a little camera behind and you see how the progression of that appointment goes. So jump on our website, access, access all those resources and it will help you just get comfortable to carry that conversation. And Gregory has a similar question. How easy is it to get appointed to sell annuities? Very easy. You just get obviously contracted, but then there's some um, carrier specific product training. Um, jump through the hoops, do it. 
you can't fail it. I think if you if you don't pass it, they'd let you just take it again. It's the easiest test. I'm a terrible test taker. Easiest thing that you can do. It just takes time. Okay. If you sell MAPD to them during the first appointment, do you still handle the end the same way? Yeah, I know we run into some red tape on uh, Medicare Advantage and all that stuff. Um, I think technically it's supposed to be on a second appointment, but the end can still be the same way. You know, based on this information, I wanted to let you know that there are multiple needs and we're going to be tackling them next appointment. I just want you to bring um, the most recent statement and then you're getting into presentation mode really on the second appointment. And that's totally, totally a OK. Um, I think if you're trying to tackle all of it in one, you're not compliant. So, yeah, do it in a two step process. Okay, do you still use the same intake sheet if you're meeting with a T65 prospect? 100%. Best, best case scenario is they are T65. And hey, help me understand what you're used to in a premium and a deductible um, max out of pocket. You know, what are you, what are you? So you're, you're, you're going through all of that regardless. I mean, we'll have people that will come to us and they're, you know, they're 55 years old. Like we know we're not helping them with Medicare, but we still want to know kind of what's going on with their big picture, see their big picture before we even dive into making any recommendations. And it is just the roadmap to where we're going to make recommendations for that client. Okay, Anthony, is there any situation where an annuity would warrant an RMD? Is there any situation where an annuity, annuity would require an RMD. So RMD is just in, in maybe a little backing up a little zoom out. Required minimum distribution is on any qualified account, tax qualified account, just meaning you've never paid taxes on this money. And so when you reach a certain age, you have to take out an RMD, required minimum distribution. That can be in an annuity. An annuity is just a vehicle in which you've decided to put your money because it's safe, because it's guaranteed interest, because of all these reasons. And the same rules apply if you take that IRA or 401k and put it in a bank CD. The same rules apply if you put it in an insurance company. The same rules apply if you roll it into a Edward Jones, Raymond James. You still have to take, no matter where the money sits, the required minimum distribution if it is a tax qualified account, such as an IRA or 401k because you've never paid taxes on the money. All right, William, do we have access to any compliant annuity presentations? When you go through the product specific training with each carrier, part of that is compliance and what you, the do's and don'ts. So I don't know that you have to worry about that um, because you're gonna be well-versed in, in the do's and don'ts through that training. Okay, Richard asks, is the three-party call a replacement for a 1035 exchange form, or do you need to do both? Uh, the three-party call is for any of the above. Anytime money is leaving any financial institution, you know that there's going to be re follow-up required. Uh, so just plan on doing that. And if you get on the phone and do a three-way and they say, uh, yeah, we've already transferred those funds. It's already, checks already been mailed. You might as well do a cartwheel. It just doesn't happen. Okay, how was your first annuity sale? How was my first? First one was awkward. <laughs> um, it's in, it's awkward, intimidating, talking about money. It starts with a relationship, a client that trusts you, knows you, likes you, all of that stuff. And you just feel a little bit comfortable and confident to bring up that conversation. Like, hey, you know, I may not know everything that I'm talking about, but I know that they're safe. I know that we're offering a better interest rate than what you got now. And it's only through doing one or doing you know, a handful of them that you, your confidence starts to grow. So the first one, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable. You write down, uh, I'm preaching for a second. If you don't know the answer, don't make it up. If you don't know the answer, just jot down the question and say, hey, that was a great question. I want to get confirmation to that uh, before I tell you something wrong, and I'll just get back with you. And, and that helps with a little bit of confidence, knowing that you don't have to know everything. If you don't know it, you're comfortable saying, I don't know. Okay, Brad asks, do you need to make any changes to your e &O coverage before selling annuities? No, sir. Okay. Uh, what, what are today's best annuity rates? 
Well, we highlighted the them, uh, just two of the products, and I'm just going to hit on that three-year plan. It blows me away, the two-year and three-year rates. And I would love to point you back to, because I can give you a rate right now, which I'll, I will. Tomorrow, it could be different. If you go to New Horizons Marketing, um, New Horizons website, and and go to the products tab, then click on annuities, and then you will see all of the current rates. And that is always kept up to date. And you'll see everything from a one year down to a 10 year uh, or better. Um, so, so they're all there, but I'll highlight one right now, the three-year plan that is at 5.65% um, is killer. It's awesome. And I just pasted that link into the chat. Take you right to our rates page. In the chat. Hey, Joran, I thought there was a mandatory four-hour NAIC annuity training. I am sure Joran is right. Um, <laughs> when you're doing, when you're getting legal beagle to do all this, whatever they tell you, whatever is needed, they tell you what you need. You go knock it out. Just sit down, grab some sweet tea and a Snickers and knock it out. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you're very assumptive by saying you have these few needs we need to tackle. I know you're here for Medicare and we need to tackle that first, but I do want to have a conversation with you regarding your retirement accounts after we finish with Medicare. Is that kind of how you handle it? Yeah, I think I would like to change the verbiage a little bit. I don't know that that feels as good as, as it does in real life. In real life, it's more along the lines of, hey, there are a lot of things that we get to help people with. And um, based on your needs assessment, I'm going to tackle the one that's going to have the greatest sense of urgency, and we're going to help you with that. But I'm not going to ignore the fact that there are other areas that we can help you with that stuff. Um, so to prevent information overload, we're not going to try and tackle it all in one setting. Uh, but just so you know, I look forward to helping you with uh, more than just this. And so when they know that, they know that you have their best interest at heart, it is well received. When we're not comfortable with the approach that I'm sharing with you guys now, we do psych ourselves out and start thinking of all these random scenarios. And I'm here to tell you, if you just kind of follow and you don't have to do what I do, but if you just kind of follow the progression of everything I just shared, it works. We, it's not just me. We have several folks in our office that benefit from the exact same system and is that system that I get pretty passionate talking about. Okay, Louis, uh, does New Horizons provide a portal in which all of the annuity car carriers contracted with can be quoted and enrolled from there? I believe that is the case. I have a, a, a routine of doing things a certain way, and I can't say that I go, the, I know what you're talking about. I don't know that, I, I know that I don't go through that. Uh, I save the links. I just save the links on my on my on my screen and I go straight to the SILAC e app or the Sentinel e app or whatever Liberty Bankers Life e app and it takes me right to that. Um, but I think what I would suggest is going to New Horizons website. When you find the um, rate that you like, you can click on more information and it leads to all the links you need for that product. Yeah, and and also if you go to our annuities page and click on any of those carriers, there will be a link to their portal. Perfect. All Last right, we're getting close least. to the end here. Um, Anthony asks, if we have a client scenario that we need guidance or assistance with, do we have a contact with New Horizons for that, or do we have to go through the carrier or fumble through it? New Horizons, all the way. 217-233-8000. Kirk, K-I-R-K. -K. A lot of people call him C-U-R-T. Kurt, it's not <laughs> Kurt. It's K-I-R-K. -K. Kirk. Ask for Kirk. There's only one Kirk here, and he will hold your hand through that. You do not have to go through the carrier. Okay. Uh, can the client double their money with an annuity, 10 or 20 years, et cetera? There's a rule on how many years it takes to double at this percentage or that. I'm not qualified to answer that. Um, you know, in time, it would double. It just depends on how long you're going to leave there and what the interest rate is. Not good at answering that question. Yeah, somebody mentioned the rule of 72. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't quote it good enough. Yeah. All right, okay. we've knocked out all the questions. Guys, we appreciate you attending. Uh, we're here to help. 
I'm just one guy. I'm just sharing my experience. There's a hundred different ways to approach what we're talking about here. We've had a lot of feedback from people wanting to know um, how we do what we do. And, and that's all we're doing. And we're just sharing. So hopefully you find it helpful. And if we can help in any way, you see the number on the bottom or at the screen there, give us a shout anytime. We'd be happy to help. Have a great one.